Okay, in chapter seven, we're talking about flow over external surfaces like cylinders, spheres, flat plates. The simplest possible geometry is a flat plate, and a flat plate is like this. So it has a length, the length from the, from the left to the right is L, okay? The width from front to back is W, we'll put that on later on, but that's W is this length, this is, this is L. We measure x from the front of the plate. The plate is assumed to be sharp edged so we get a nice clean cut on the velocity approaching it. The velocity approaching it is capital U. Uh, the heat transfer textbook uses U infinity. We've got to shift gears. We're in uh, ME312 fluids. They call U, capital U, the free stream velocity. That's approaching this plate. When it strikes the plate, a boundary layer builds up. So I'm going to show the boundary layer like this. This is called the edge of the boundary layer. What is the boundary layer? Okay, the word gives it away. It's a layer near the boundary of a solid body in external flow. So it's the layer of fluid close to the body, the boundary. Um, what happens in the boundary layers? Why is it important? Well, the boundary layer is critically important in analyzing the drag force on objects. So if we're calculating the drag force on anything, we're interested in the boundary layer because that's where the effects of viscosity are predominant. Outside the boundary layer, viscosity is not important. Viscosity is important here in the boundary layer. Um, I'll just show you how a velocity profile looks in the boundary layer. Why is it called free stream? Free stream means far away from the plate itself. So the free stream velocity is the velocity of the stream of fluid. I'm going to use air just as a, as a fluid. It could be water, it could be oil, whatever. I'll use air just to talk about it in class. So here comes this airstream. Its velocity is uniform, uniform, capital U. It's the free stream velocity. It's the velocity far up here, the velocity here, capital U. It's far away from the plate here, capital U. That's why it's called free stream, away from the uh, solid body. Okay, so outside the boundary layer, pretty much the velocity is capital U, the free stream velocity. So we take that velocity and we put it over here. U, U, U. So outside the, and we abbreviate that, BL stands for boundary layer. We're gonna be initially concerned only with a laminar boundary layer. So laminar boundary layer. Okay, the, um, Laminar boundary layer is defined by the Reynolds number. The Reynolds number L is equal to our capital um, U times L over uh, nu, or in terms of X, it'd be UX over nu. So laminar boundary layer, if the Reynolds number based on L is less than or equal to 500,000, then boundary layer is laminar. So if we can calculate the Reynolds number at the end of the plate, and if that Reynolds number is less than 500,000, then that boundary layer is gonna be a laminar boundary layer. We're going to discuss laminar boundary layers today, and then when we come back after the midterm, we'll discuss turbulent boundary layers. But for right now, it's a laminar boundary layer. All right, now, the velocity of the fluid at the plate surface, the plate stationary. The velocity of fluid at the plate surface is the no-slip condition, no-slip condition from ME311 fluids one. 
No slip means if the plate's stationary, the velocity of the fluid molecules adjacent to the plate are zero. So the velocity goes down to zero. The velocity anywhere in the boundary layer is given by little u, and it's a function of x and y. x is measured horizontal, y is measured from the plate surface vertically up. So the velocity in the boundary layer is a measure of x and y. Okay, so I think that's all we need here for right now. Um, we have to develop the equations for the boundary layer. So the equations for the boundary layer. We have to go way back to our fluids one. Fluids one, Navier-Stokes equations. And that was equation 714B, equations 714B from fluids one, our fluids one class. We, um, if we ne neglect several things, it looks like this. And that is for steady incompressible in there there's a little V okay Little u is the velocity in the boundary layer pointing in the x direction. So little u is the velocity at any point in the boundary layer in the x direction. Little v is the velocity in the boundary layer at any particular point in the y direction. At every point in the boundary layer there's going to be a u and a v. Okay, here's the equation. This is Navier-Stokes, there's a u, there's a v. Little v is very, very small compared to little u. So the vertical component of velocity in the boundary layer is really, really small compared to the horizontal component, this guy. But they're both in there. Okay, so then uh, we make some assumptions from the Navier-Stokes equations. It's steady, it's incompressible. This term here in the boundary layer has been shown to be negligible. So we neglect it. This term here, we can show is goes to zero. The, this is all done in the text, but the point being is you start with the Navier-Stokes equations from fluids one. You make some assumptions which are appropriate in the boundary layer. Two terms drop out. This is, by the way, the x-momentum equation, not the, the x-momentum. And we end up with the boundary layer equation here. I'm going to put down continuity first. Of course, we have continuity. Okay, so our continuity, partial u with respect to x plus partial v with respect to y is equal to zero. And now we have um, the um, Navier-Stokes in the boundary layer, x momentum, with all those assumptions. And we have this one, u partial u with respect to x, v partial u with respect to y, equal nu, second partial of u with respect to y, Net momentum flux x direction, net momentum flux y direction, viscous effects. Nu has viscosity in it. That's the viscous forces. 
Okay, so those are our two equations. And then we have um, some uh, boundary conditions, BCs, boundary conditions at y equals zero. u equal v equals zero and uh, at y equal delta u equal capital U. Delta is called the boundary layer thickness. So at any particular x position Delta goes from the solid surface out to the location where the velocity u, little u, it's really 99% of capital U, but uh, it's so close that we just call it uh, little u equal capital U at y equal delta. But realistically, it's, it approaches it asymptotically so that uh, it's, we just take 99% as being really close to the final value U, capital U. Okay, um, solve these guys by a numerical integration. Uh, table 7-1. First column, second column, And all the values are in there. They're presented in a tabular form. Yeah. Which one? Now this one up here. Yeah. Uh, let's see. What we got there. That came from there. We got x's there. We've got x's there. We've got x's there. Y's. Uh, that's y. That's x. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. There's, no. You give me an x and a y at this point right here. Here's the x value. There's the y value. There's the x value. I put that x and y in this table. X and y, free stream velocity, fluid properties. I go over here, this, co this column, I can get little u. I can get little u there. Okay, so I can get little u that way. Uh, this result tells me that um, when this parameter gets to 5, I'm 99% of the free stream velocity. That's the definition of the boundary layer. Edge of the boundary layer is where little u over capital U equal 99%. So that gives us uh, we have delta equal 5 over the square root, capital U, new x, and that's 5x over the square root of the Reynolds number x. So that is one of our important equations for the boundary layer thickness. Okay. So, we're interested in the shear stress at the wall. And we call that tau sub s. That's the um, surface shear stress. And we know that that's equal to mu du dy 
at the location of the surface. The surface is at y equals zero for my picture. We determine the partial of u with respect to y from table 7-1. You can do that. If you do that, you get this result, 0 0.332. When you shift from fluids to heat transfer class, you, there, there's going to be some changes, of course, because everything is not the same symbols. So in the heat transfer class, we call that C sub F sub X. Um, and uh, we call the free stream velocity U infinity. It's just different textbooks, so you have to live with that. Okay, now, <clears throat> this is the shear stress at the surface of the plate, Y equals zero obtained from table 7-1. But we define the shear stress also like this. The shear stress equal some parameter. This guy is called the skin friction coefficient. F stands for friction, C stands for coefficient, multiplied by something like the kinetic energy of the approaching free stream, rho u squared divided by two, kinetic energy of the approaching free stream. That's how we define C sub F. That equation is a definition of C sub F. That's where it came from. Uh, that equation there from fluids one, they throw it out at you and say, we're going to use this to find the pressure drop in a pipe of length L and diameter D. So what did we engineers come up with to do that? We said, okay, you know what? We're going to invent something called F, and I'm going to call F the friction factor. Where'd that come from? Some solution of a governing partial differential equation? No, 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 and no. We defined it that way. We said, we're going to invent something called F to make your life easier. And if you can find F from an equation or a graph, maybe the Moody chart, you can find the delta P pretty easily. And we're going to multiply that F by a geometric factor, L over D, and by something that looks like the approaching kinetic energy from the free stream. There we go again. Or the, in this case, the pipe velocity. V squared divided by 2G. Gamma, what, rho? Rho's up here. Okay, rho G. G's cancel out, G's cancel out. F, L over D, rho V squared divided by 2. Rho V squared divided by 2. Very similar. If something works for, one thing we do as engineers, you think, you know what? Maybe it'll work for flow over a flat plate like it worked for, for flow in a pipe. Except I'm not going to call it F now. I'm going to call it C sub F and call it the skin friction coefficient. That's the way we think as engineers. Very similar, though. Very similar. We invented this Y because it's very, very useful. We invent this Y because it's very, very useful. You want the exact value? There it is. But we like to use C sub F. So we combine these two guys now because they're the same, tau s, there it is. Okay, there's a u to the u times one half, u times one half, there's a u squared. Find c sub f, so get, we get c sub f. Turns out to be then 0 0.664 divided by Reynolds x to the one half. 
we'll box him in. We don't need to box these guys in, but I'll just do it to remind you these are important. Okay. Um, let's plot the skin friction coefficient versus x. Okay, go ahead and put x equals zero in there. Oh boy. x equals zero. As x goes to zero, the wall of shear stress becomes very, very large. And as x gets bigger, the shear stress goes down. Linearly, no. One over the square root. So as you get close to x equals zero, a very, very large shear stress. And as you go down in x direction, the shear stress goes down like that. So where is the biggest shear stress on the flat plate? Right up at the leading edge or the location where x equals zero. As you go down this way, the shear stress gets smaller and smaller. Why is that? It's the slope of the u versus y graph. The slope here is very, very steep. Very steep slope. Slope gets smaller. It's getting smaller. Smaller, smaller, smaller. So it depends on the slope of du dy at y equals zero. Okay, the friction coefficient, got it. But many times I want to find out the drag force on the whole plate. The drag force on the plate. That's the skin friction as a function of x. You give me an x, I'll tell you what the skin friction is. But now to get the drag force on the plate, We have to, of course, integrate the skin friction times the area. So the drag force as a function of x is equal to b is the width of the plate into the blackboard. Times the uh, integral from 0 to uh, x. This is the drag force at any x position, up to x position 0 to x. Tau s as a function of x times uh, dx. The plate area is b dx. What's a shear stress? A force divided by area. When you multiply a shear stress by an area, what do you get? A force. Okay, we want the drag force. That's why you multiply the shear stress times dA integrated from x equals zero to any x value you want, x. So what do I do? I put this guy into there. Tau s. Put him in there. There's x. Integrate with respect to x. The drag force um, comes out to be 0 0.664b square root rho mu u to the 3 halves. Uh, we define d uh, over the whole length of the plate. Okay, that, that came from, from us, it's, an, it's what we want to do. We want to express the drag force in terms of the kinetic energy of the approaching stream times the area, what's the area of the plate? The length is L, the width is B, this is the area of the plate. This is the C sub D. 
This guy is called the drag coefficient. Don't forget, these coefficients are dimensionless. I, I make my capital C with the little bars on them so you don't get, this is a lowercase c here, this is a lowercase c, subscript F. This is an uppercase c, subscript D. D stands for drag force over the plate of length L. That's a drag force over a plate of length L. And Now, I equate these two guys. Drag coefficient C sub D. So, what can we find so far for, for the force, for the flow over a flat plate? All right, number one, if somebody asks us to find U and V, we can find that from the table I mentioned in the, in the chapter. So we can find little U and little V at any X and Y. Okay, that's number one. Number two, we can find the boundary layer thickness delta at any X position. Okay, the equation. Five will just square root Reynolds number. We can find, here's, we can find, 5x, we can find the shear stress at any x position. Here's the equation. If we want, we can find the skin friction coefficient, c sub f, little c sub f. We can find the drag force on the plate between x equals zero and uh, x equal x, random x. Here it is. We can define something called the drag coefficient, capital C sub D, here it is, and express it if you want in a simple formula like this. Here's the simple formula for the wall shear stress. Here's a simple formula for the drag force on a plate of length L. Okay, every equation on this, well, almost every equation, on this board is for laminar flow. This guy doesn't matter, laminar or turbulent. This guy doesn't matter, laminar or turbulent. He's laminar, he's laminar, he's laminar, he's laminar, he's laminar, okay? So, laminar flow. All done mathematically correct from the governing partial differential equations. Turbulent flow, not so easy, obviously. Not so easy. All right. So we're going to discuss turbulent flow when we come back a week from today after the midterm on uh, Wednesday. So we'll come back to this again. Revisit the same stuff now for turbulent flow over a flat plate next time we meet. Okay, now, we're going to talk a little bit about the, uh, the midterm coming up uh, on Wednesday. It uh, covers on the board over there chapters 5 and 9 just those two chapters, and in chapter nine, compressible flow, everything but converging, diverging nozzles with a shock wave in the nozzle, the diverging portion. There'll be nothing on that midterm on converging, diverging nozzles with a shock wave in the diverging part of the nozzle. That's safe for the final exam. Everything else is okay. Converging nozzles, shock waves, isentropic flow. Choke flow, all those magic terms. We just did that for the last 14 days, so I'm not gonna spend time reviewing that. You've got online now, of course, uh, a practice exam from the fall quarter that I gave. Um, so you can look at that and go through that. Um, problem two, I put some corrections on the board which didn't get on the exam, so replace problem two 
online, which is online for you on Blackboard website, with this. This is the problem two that I corrected during the class time for the students that took that midterm in the fall quarter. Okay, so we won't go through. I think it's fairly straightforward. If you have any questions, I've got office hours, three office hours before Wednesday. Tomorrow, 9 to 11. Wednesday, 10, 30, 11, 30. Okay. Okay, nothing on this stuff here, of course. Okay, um, so I'm going to go back, since it's been a while, and look at a couple of problems from chapter five, okay? So let's start out and uh, take a look at uh, the dimensionless, the important dimensionless parameters in a problem and maybe using the pi theorem for that. Okay, so we'll start off on that. All right, so I'm going to take this problem, a rotating disk in a, in a um, container. So I'll try and draw a good picture of this if I can, this example. So we have a shaft, and on that shaft, there's a thin little disk here and that disk is rotating at a speed of omega, and the torque required to rotate that in this fluid is T, T stands for torque. So here's the fluid level. The fluid has a density rho and a viscosity mu. And the diameter of this disk is D. And the clearance between the disk and this beaker, our reservoir it's in, is little d. That's the clearance between the wall and the rotating disk. And I think that's all we're going to look at. So the problem says the torque necessary to rotate this disk at an angular speed of omega is a function of the density, the viscosity, uh, the speed you rotate it as, the clearance, diam uh, the clearance distance D, and the disk distance capital D. And the problem says find all the important dimensionless parameters. Find the important dimensionless <coughs> parameters that characterize this problem. Okay, if it's, it's helpful to put this stuff down. Okay, so what are the dimensions of density? Uh, mass per volume. What's volume? Length cubed. Okay, got it. Uh, mu. Okay, there's a table in the textbook. There's a table in your data package you'll get with the exam. It has all these dimensions in it. You don't have to invent it. Oh, you can invent it. That's not a problem. <laughs> you would you waste your time. You know what U is length, uh, length per time. You know what that guy is length. You know what he is force over area. What's force? M L over T squared. What's area? L squared. You can do it yourself. You don't need to. You don't need a table. That's just a little helpful thing. But you got the table. So okay, you got the table. Go find mu in the table. Mu m over lt. Uh, omega. It's not revolutions per minute. Don't forget these guys are, you gotta specify them in, in radians. Radians per second, so okay. Radians per second, what's radians? Dimensionless omega, one over time. Uh, diameter of the disk length, 
spacing of the, between the disc and the outside wall length. One, two, three, four, five. One, two, three, four, five, six. Okay, torque. Torque. You can reinvent the wheel. What's a torque? It's like, it, it has the units of, of, of a moment, a force times a distance. So F times distance. What's a force? ML over T squared. What's a distance? L. You can do it yourself. But it's in the table, so go ahead and use the table. ML squared over T squared. Okay. Um, number of important dimensionless parameters. Okay. M minus N. M. One, two, three, four, five, six. N, number of dimensions, M, L, T, three, M, L, T, three pies. Okay, got it. The problem said, um, find the important dimensions pi parameters, find one of them by the pi theorem, and the other, you can find any way you want. That's what the problem said. You can, said, find one by the pi theorem and find the rest any way you want. Now, you could find them all by the pi theorem. But in a timed exam, that might not be the most efficient way to go. So I'm going to find one right away. And here's the rule. Any dimensionless parameter that you find is a pi parameter. Okay, by observation. Pi one is equal to little d over big D. Of course, length over length is dimensionless. I can see it right away. You wanna check it? Okay, you don't get check it, but check. Length over length. Yep, it's dimensionless. When you do that, it's best if you knock one of these guys out from that list. Okay. Either knock out little d or big D, but knock, this is one pi parameter, knock one out. I'm going to knock out little d. Go on. I say, um, you know what? I think, I think I see pi 2 by observation. Let me think now, um, what is a Reynolds number? A Reynolds number is um, a velocity times a distance times a density divided by the viscosity. Oh, there's viscosity, there's density, there's a distance. I need a velocity. What's a velocity? Length over time. If I multiply d times omega, what am I going to get? Some kind of velocity. Yeah, I sure am. Ah, there it is right there. Okay, I got pi two. It's like the Reynolds number. Uh, rho something velocity divided by mu times a distance, d. What's my velocity? Uh, multiply omega times d, I get a velocity. You wanna check it, you know, go ahead and, and, and check it. Mass over length cubed, one over t. L squared divided by mu, mu is M over LT. Cancel, 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 cancel. Yep, it sure is. There it is. I found two pi parameters just by looking at things. It took me probably a minute or less. Now, but the problem said, find one by the pi theorem. No, okay. As soon as you do this, you knock out another variable from that list. Okay? So what I not I knocked out mu. I don't like mu because it's long, so I got rid of mu. I don't like it, it's gone. Okay, now comes the pi theorem. Pi three. What, what are the rules? Okay, um, repeating variables. First of all, one rule said, do not pick the dependent variable as repeating. 
torque is a dependent variable. Do not choose it as repeating, okay? What's left? I have no choice. Rho omega d, okay? So what I took, I took it this way. Rho to the a, omega to the b, diameter to the c times torque. Torque sits out there by itself. Okay, rho, mass over length cubed to the A. Omega, 1 over T to the B. Diameter, length to the C. Torque, ML squared over T squared. Okay, I get uh, mass to the A plus 1. I get uh, length to the minus 3a plus c plus 2. I get time uh, to the minus b minus 2. Set these equal to 0. And I get A equal minus 1, B equal minus 2, C equal minus 5. By solving those equations algebraically. So I get pi 3 equal torque to the first power divided by density to the A omega squared. Diameter to the fifth. Uh, I better check it. Torque ML squared over T squared. Uh, rho M over L cubed. Uh, omega 1 over T squared. Uh, D link squared. Link to the fifth, pardon me. Link to the fifth. Cancel, 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 cancel. Yep, it all cancels out. I am okay. I found pi three. If you don't check those pi parameters on an exam, you won't find your mistakes. If you made an algebraic mistake here, and you try this game right here, you won't get it dimensionless. It'll tell you, you made a mistake somewhere, better double check your algebra. So you, you, there's no reason to leave an exam without getting those guys right because you'll, as long as you check all these guys, you'll be okay, you'll be okay. Now, if you want to do them without that by observation, okay, let's do it by that. It's gonna take a little longer, that's okay, but if the problem says find these pi parameters by using the pi theorem, you've got no choice, you gotta do it. Okay, I choose repeating variables. Uh, I'm going to get pi 1 equal. I'm going to choose repeating variables. Don't forget the rule. Don't choose a dependent variable. Don't choose him. Got it. Don't forget the rule. Make sure you see mass, length, and time at least once. These would not be good. Don't choose omega d and little d. I don't see mass in them. Right, don't choose it. I'm going to choose um, rho, uh, omega, and d. Rho to the a, omega to the b, d to the c. Now, which one didn't you use? I used him, I used him. I didn't use mu, so I'll put mu out here. And pi 2. Okay, repeating. A, omega to the B, D to the C. Now, I use mu. Okay, um, I didn't use little d yet. No, put little d out there. Pi 3, repeating variables. That's why they're called repeating. You see them all here. They're repeating. What's left? Dependent variable T, the torque. Solve for these guys. Solve for A, B, and C. You get these guys. You say, yeah, but you know what, I am. Um, uh, when I 
left the class, I talked to my friend Joe, and he got different pi parameters. I think Joe's wrong. No, I think Joe's right. He's okay. Don't worry about Joe. Worry about yourself, okay? Uh, because I'm going to choose repeating variables now of, of rho, mu, and omega. Do I see mass once? Yeah, I do. Length once? Yes, I do. Time once? At least once. Yeah, I do. Rho, mu, and d. Pi 1. Rho to the a, mu to the b, d to the c, little d. Pi 2. Rho to the a, mu to the b, d to the c. Then I've got da 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 da. I need my big D and little d. Big D. Uh, yeah, I've got my big D. Okay, mu. Got it, got it. And I got the other one as D. Okay, big D. Omega and little d. Omega. Pi 3. Rho to the A, mu to the B, D to the C times torque. Okay, if I do that one, and these are fine, and these are fine, I'm going to get three, maybe three. Maybe they'll all be different. They will be probably different, yeah. Different pi parameters than this guy got. Who's right? They're both right. As long as you found a set of dimensionless parameters, you're right. Nobody's wrong. I could choose another set of repeating variables. There, there's three sets of them. So in the class, one third of the class might choose these. One third of the class might choose these. One third of the class might choose the other three you can use. And they'll, each person in these three groups will get different pi parameters, but everybody's right, nobody's wrong. Why are they all right? Because, I, I can't spend the time in a short class, but you can take these pi parameters and multiply and divide them and raise them into powers and get these guys. They're not independent. That's the key. You can take pi 1 to the power, square it. Pi 2, uh, 1 over pi 2. Pi 3, cubit, and you might get that pi 2. You can take these pi parameters, raise them to powers, and end up with these pi parameters because they're not independent. That's why they work that way. Okay, a long story, but I just want to show you if it's by, if the problem says only work at one, one pi parameter by the pi theorem, the other two you might be able to get easily by taking ratios. If you see an efficiency in this list, if there is an efficiency in this list, Let's say that uh, eta is whatever, 40%. It's a pump. The efficiency is 70%. Ah, that's it. Pi 1 is eta. Why? Because an efficiency is dimensionless. As long as it's dimensionless, it's a valid pi parameter. So efficiencies, use it as a pi parameter. A ratio of diameters, write it down right away. You see something that looks like the Reynolds number, write it down right away if you've got the choice. If you don't have the choice, okay, choose three repeating variables and find the three pi parameters. Or choose a different three variables and find these pi parameters. Nobody's wrong. Everybody's right. Okay. Now, let's take this problem. Um, this one is a, um, I'm going to put that over here. This one is a similarity problem. Okay, similarity. It's problem out of the textbook is problem 584. I assigned it for homework, but I had several questions on it, so I'm going to go through it kind of in class now. Uh, ocean piling. Okay, um, ocean current. is uh, 150 centimeters per second, 1.5 meters per second. It has a wave period of 12 seconds. Uh, it has a uh, wave height of 3 meters. Okay, it's tested in a 1 15th scale model water channel. Uh, 
Okay, find uh, the speed, the period, and the height of the model. Okay, let's get the wave height first. Uh, the, in, in the real ocean piling, so, you know, here's the ocean piling. I don't know what it's holding up. Maybe it's holding up an oil rig out in the middle of the Gulf of Mexico. I don't know. Here comes these waves. They're going to hit that ocean piling. I'm worried about the whole thing collapsing out in the ocean. Hurricane force winds. This is the wave height. This is the wave period, peak to peak, okay? This is a wave velocity moving towards there. Okay, that's what they mean. It could be the Santa Monica Pier. Okay, same thing. All right, uh, hey, height, I know height, geometric similarity. The um, height of the model to the height of the prototype is 1 to 15. So the height of the model, which is the height of the waves here, peak to peak, or peak to trough, uh, LM is 1 15th of LP, which is uh, 3 over 15. So 0 0.20 meters, got it. Um, I'm gonna put that here. Let's see now, there is, um, there's the ocean which is water and there's air up here. So my best guess is from what you copied down from my lecture in your class notes says, if there's an interface of a fluid and a gas, think about the Froude number. Okay, I think about the Froude number. Why? Because I see water touching air. There's an interface. So I think the Froude number is important. Okay, Froude number model equal Froude number prototype. Froude number V over LG. V prototype over LG. I'm testing it at the same location, where G is the same at, that, at both locations, the lab and the ocean. So G is the same, I'll assume. If it's not, if it's Denver and you know, Los Angeles, then change it for a mile high. But no, I'm saying the G's are the same. Gone, gone. So I want the velocity of the model. Velocity of the model equal to LM over LP times the velocity uh, of the prototype. Okay, model is 1 to 15. Velocity of the prototype of the waves, 150 centimeters per second. That's 10 centimeters per second. That should be the speed set in the lab in the water channel. Then I say, okay, now I've got this omega thing. Um, I think I remember from what's in my class notes that if there's something that's oscillating, uh, like maybe um, a power line in a Santa Ana wind, which is doing this, or any kind of oscillation like a wind turbine with the turbine blades rotating out near Palm Springs, I think I'm supposed to use a Struhl number. Right, Struhl number. Why? It's the only one that has omega in it, first of all, so it's easy. The only place you're going to find that omega, which is here, is going to be in the Struhl number, so it's not a big guessing game. So equate Struhl. Okay, so I get uh, Struhl model equals Struhl prototype. The Struhl is omega L over V. Omega L over V. 
I want omega of the model. Omega of the model is equal to V model over V prototype times L prototype over L model times omega prototype. Okay. V, uh, v prototype uh, over V model is equal to L prototype over L model. That came from the Froude number. Put him down there. Okay. Uh, oh, that should be. Okay, flip flop that guy. So, V model over V prototype is L model over L prototype. And cancel, cancel, one, one, one. Omega P, didn't change. Omega P, one over 12. seconds to the minus one. So the omega didn't change because the things all canceled out. So the omega gave it away. Struhl number. Water and air gave it away. Froude number. Geometric uh, similarity. That gave me the, the length, the length scale right here. LM 0.2 meters. Okay, so that's how you do, that was, that was the toughest one of the homework set. That's why I worked in class to kind of walk you through it, okay. All right, good stopping point. <laughs> We're gonna have to